Well, welcome to Dairy Livestream. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairymen. We are broadcasting from the Cheese Cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson at the historic W.D. Hord & Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Hord and who also founded Hordes Dairymen. This dairy live stream episode is made possible thanks to general support from our friends at the Journal of Nutrient Management. Today's conversation will focus on export potential, chatter on the cheese markets. This webcast will be available on our Hordes Dairyman YouTube channel within 24 hours after the live event. Dairy live stream is also available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Search for Dairy Livestream from the convenience of your smartphone to download it. As we get going, a reminder to our audience, as you hear from our panelists, please submit your questions into the GoToWebinar question panel. The earlier you ask a question, the more likely we will ask it on the air. Let's turn our attention to export potential chatter on the cheese markets. Before we hear from Stephen Kane, let's go to our first poll question. What country is the world's single largest cheese exporter, the United States, New Zealand, Germany, Canada, or Australia? So go ahead and put your correct answers in there. And uh, this will set the stage for our conversation today. So we'll wait until about half of our audience has uh, answered that question. And while the answers are rolling in strong here, so let's go ahead and end that poll question. The correct answer, 68% of you got it correct, is the United States. Let's quickly talk about those other countries. New Zealand is the second largest cheese exporter and the world's largest overall dairy product exporter. That small island nation has about the same surface area as Wisconsin. Uh, now, if you took all the countries of the European Union and put them into one nation, then the U European Union would surpass the United States. But the United States produces the most cheese in the world, and a lot of high quality cheese, I should add. To open this discussion, we will invite Stephen Kane to Dairy Livestream. Stephen Kane is an economic analyst with the U.S. Dairy Export Council, who specializes in analyzing both domestic dairy production and global trade in dairy products. Prior to joining the U.S. Dairy Export Council, Stephen worked as an agribusiness consultant with IHS Market where he covered several commodities and specialized in economic impact analysis. Stephen, can you share with us some top-line global market dynamics and how the U.S. cheese sector is doing overall? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thanks, Corey, for uh, uh, having me on. Happy to be here. Yeah, so I guess I'll start uh, you know, just the, the top-level overall trade for, uh, for cheese and then talk a little bit about um, how the U.S. fits into that. Um, you know, so globally, cheese trade is li really at an all-time high. Uh, year to date through June, uh, global exports are at 2.6 billion pounds, um, through, uh, up nearly 10% over the same period last year. Um, what that does, it really puts us on pace to have uh, the highest annual volume of cheese exports in a single year ever. Um, so we're just at some really high export levels uh, currently for cheese. Uh, so the next natural question is, uh, why are we exporting so much and where is all this cheese going? Well, why? Uh, global demand is strong. Uh, you know, really folks are just consuming more and more cheese. And as that demand grows, folks are turning towards the global market uh, to meet that demand whenever their domestic market can't meet that demand fully. Um, so it's really some great numbers and looking bullish for exports there. Uh, where, uh, you know, over the last 12 months, uh, Eurasia, China, and South America have all seen the largest increases in cheese imports. Uh, combined for the three exports are up 22% uh, over the last 12 months, uh, which is just some incredible growth numbers there. Uh, but they're not the only ones that are experiencing growth. 12 of the 15 largest cheese importing countries in the world are all importing more cheese. Uh, so the, really that's just um, goes to show that this demand increase is not isolated just to a few handful of countries around the world. Uh, this is really just a global uptick in, uh, in demand for cheese um, and it's really bullish for exports there. So where does the U.S. fall in 
uh, with all of this increase in exports. Uh, so far in 2021, uh, U.S. has exported 516 million pounds of cheese, uh, which is ahead of where we were last year and puts us on pace to have uh, one of the best years on record for cheese exports. So, you know, again, why, why are we exporting so much? Uh, again, global demand is up. And, you know, as we just saw from the poll, the U.S. is the largest single uh, supplier of cheese to the world. Uh, so with that increasing demand, the U.S. is really well positioned uh, to capitalize on that demand increase uh, and really grow our export numbers, both in volume overall and capitalizing on increases in market share as well. Um, so looking at the U.S. specifically, where is all this cheese going? Uh, so to quickly break down where our, our major cheese trading partners are, uh, around 30% of our cheese exports go to Japan and Korea. Uh, around 25% goes to Mexico. Uh, around 15% goes to Latin America, excluding Mexico. Uh, so combined Latin America total with Mexico and the other countries around 40%. Uh, and the remaining 30% goes to some of our smaller uh, trading, uh, trading countries. So basically what that means is around three quarters of all of our cheese exports are going to Japan and Korea and Latin America. And the big driver for U.S. cheese exports over this year has really been Latin America, uh, which over the last 12 months is up 34 uh, percent, which is just some really great uh, growth numbers there. And so focusing in that a little bit more, uh, I think there's a combination of factors that are really uh, helping drive those gains to Latin America. Uh, first, favorable U.S. pricing uh, and proximity to the region. Uh, U.S. cheese prices are competitive on the market right now. Uh, and again, our proximity to the region allows us to uh, be a little more competitive uh, with freight advantages there as well. Uh, also, vaccine progress in uh, South America has been increasing. Um, it was pretty slow going there for a while, but more recently they picked up. The vaccination rates are climbing. Uh, and really what this does is it allows for these countries to uh, really just forge ahead with economic reopenings. Uh, so what that means is domestic population is getting out and about more, uh, driving demand for food service, driving demand for cheese uh, throughout the country. What that also means is that uh, tourism is coming back. And that's a big piece for Mexico and many uh, other parts of Central America. Um, folks are coming in, tourism, and that's driving food service even more on helping bolster those exports to the region. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, port congestion. That has been, uh, you know, that's not, not a new thing now. Folks are well aware that uh, exports coming out of the West Coast are backed up. There's a lot of congestion. We're at record levels of, of boats waiting outside ports to be offloaded. Uh, but where we're capitalizing on that with South America and Central America is that a lot of our cheese going to this region is not going out of the West Coast. Um, it's either coming across the southern border uh, via truck and rail, uh, it's coming out of the Gulf, or a lot of it's coming out of the East Coast. And so what that's allowing us to do uh, is really avoid a lot of that uh, congestion on the West Coast. Um, and it's not backing up our exports uh, to the same extent as it is on the West Coast. That's great there as well. Um, so that's kind of a quick rundown of where we are so far uh, this year, but uh, quickly, you know, what does the rest of the year look like? Are we going to see continued growth? Are we expecting a slowdown? Uh, you know, what what do we think is going to happen? Um, and I'm I'm pretty optimistic for the remainder of the year. I think we'll see continued uh, solid exports throughout the year, uh, and I think we'll see that for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, U.S. milk production. Um, we've got a lot of cows uh, right now, and we've got a lot of milk on hand, even as we go into a uh, seasonal decline uh, in output, uh, we've still got a lot of milk. Um, and that's that means there's a lot of milk available for cheese production. But also we have increased uh, processing capacity as well. Um, you know, we've had a number of plants uh, with expansions, have some new plants come online over the last year. Um, that's really allowed us to ramp up that cheese production as well. Um, and so both of those factors uh, really in the face of global uh, supply of milk production and cheese uh, production really is helping us be competitive on the world market. Uh, so we've got a lot of milk, got a lot of cheese production. Uh, in the EU, they've been struggling a little bit with milk production. Overall, year to date, uh, their production is only up about 0.3%. Uh, so not some real high numbers there. 
that's limiting their amount of uh, milk availability going into cheese production, uh, and then also limiting the amount of product that's able to leave the country. Uh, so that's helping keep those prices elevated out of the EU and helping us be a little more competitive on the world market. Uh, and lastly, demand seems to be strong. Um, you know, all of our exporting destinations um, seems to be having strong demand. Japan and Korea, that demand is continuing. Uh, in Latin America, this continued recovery uh, is promising and really supportive for those continued exports. Uh, but, you know, there are a couple threats to keep on your mind as well. Uh, again, uh, shipping constraints and backlogs. Uh, you know, while we're able to avoid some of that going down to South America and Central America, um, it's still still impacting a sizable amount of our cheese exports going out of the West Coast. Um, overall, about 66% of our total dairy exports that leave the country on a vessel leave via the West Coast. Um, and honing in on cheese, coming out of the LA Long Beach port, which is really where we're seeing the epicenter of the, the backlog constraints, um, about 25% of our cheese exports leaving the US on a vessel leave via that port. And so you can understand why that's such an impact and a uh, concern and a constraint on our exports uh, for cheese coming out of the West Coast. So we need to keep that uh, front and center like I'm sure most all of us are. Um, the one downside is I don't think we're gonna see this backlog clean up uh, by the end of the year, uh, specifically with uh, increased purchases for Christmas. We've seen a lot of containers come in uh, that's contributing to the congestion backlog. Um, I don't think it'll be until sometime probably late 2022 when we finally see the backlog have a chance to kind of work its way through uh, the infrastructure. And so that is one. Uh, also COVID, you know, it's not going away. It's here to stay. Um, and the impact of that in our exporting destinations uh, is really a factor. So uh, specifically in South America where the COVID, where the vaccination rate um, is something less than 30%. Um, you know, it's not as bad as some countries, but it's not great as well. Um, that puts an increased risk in those regions for uh, an outbreak to occur. If that leads to a country uh, going back into lockdown, that's really going to put uh, an impact on our ability to export that product to those regions if the demand is decreasing. Um, so despite those, though, I'm still I'm still optimistic for our cheese exports uh, for the remainder of the year. I think we're in a good position globally uh, with our product availability versus our other major competitors. Um, and I think we'll be price competitive uh, and we'll really uh, see a strong finish to the year here. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Corey. Thank you, Stephen. As a reminder to our audience, as you hear from our panelists, please submit your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. And the earlier you ask a question, the more likely it'll get answered on air. Before we invite our next guest, let's go to a poll question. Where is the USA Cheese Specialist Certification Program training chefs? Select one or more of the following, China, Japan, Mexico, South Korea, or the United Arab and or the United Arab Emirates. So go ahead and answer that. And look forward to seeing what everyone's thinking on that front here before we turn it over to Angelique. So let's give everybody about five more seconds to answer this. And Caitlin can go ahead and cut the poll question off. Well, the correct answer, you could take them all to 100%. That's correct. China, Japan, Mexico, South Korea, the United Arab Emirates, and even Taiwan could be added to that list. These are places where the US a cheese specialist certification program is training chefs. And I think it's not only us, we have to think way beyond selling cheese here. We have to be partners. We have to be develop relationships. And it's with relationships in mind, it's certainly a pleasure to invite Angelique Hollister to Dairy Livestream. If you haven't met Angelique before, don't let that French accent fool you. Angelique is an unabashed supporter of US dairy and one of the U.S. Dairy Export Council's longest serving employees having been with the organization for 21 years. Remember the U.S. Dairy Export Council was founded 26 years ago. Angelique knows her craft having received five promotions at U.S. Dairy Export Council. Today she serves as the Senior Vice President of Global Cheese Marketing where she's responsible for developing impactful marketing strategies and programs 
that enhance international demand for U.S. cheese and consumer dairy products. Since beginning her vocation with U.S. Dairy Export Council in 2000, Angelique has sought to educate overseas importers, distributors, retail buyers, chefs, and food service professionals on the taste applications and quality of U.S. cheese. Angelique, can you share with us more about the approach on value-added products like cheese and some working examples? Yes, uh, thank you, Corey, and I'm uh, glad to be here and, and happy to share, you know, with uh, with your audience, like what we do at US Deck to like to help the industry grow and continue to grow. Uh, I like your question about the uh, the largest cheese exporter uh, in the world. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because while the industry has come a long way in my 21 years um, uh, at the council, you know, they export when seven times. You know, they grew seven times uh, or over. Uh, over my time at the council. So, you know, it's, the industry's really done well. And we really went from being a nobody in the export market to, uh, to really being a leading force. Um, but frankly, you know, funny enough, it's, it's uh, while we're, we are by data, you know, proven and, and a, an expert in uh, exporting cheese, uh, we actually do still don't have to this day that reputation. Uh, you know, I, by now, you know, with all the work that's been done and, and the great efforts of, of our suppliers in, in the market coming along, uh, importers, distributors in the markets, they, they know about us, they know we exist and, you know, that we do sell cheese. But when we really dig deeper into the market um, and, and you talk to end users, you know, like chefs or, or consumers, uh, they really don't have an image or a perception of our industry. Well, I guess I, I would say probably they, they do have an image, but it's not a good one. It's, uh, you know, they usually when people think about U.S. cheese, they think about the plasticky, orange-looking cheese, the little square thing. Uh, processed cheese that goes on the burger, and that's about it. So that's really how they um, how they, they view us. You know, when I first came to this country, that's that that was my picture of of the U.S. as making cheese. Um, so it's been really fun over the past twenty years to uh, to really prove the world that you know we have a lot more to offer as an industry. Uh, so you know, obviously, like you heard uh, Stephen mention, we're doing great in exports with the leading, and so you know, I guess one could say, well, you know, we're done. You know, job done. We can just rest and and be all good. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more to be get done in, in the export market to really, you know, ensure that our industry uh, really remain healthy and, and prosper for the, for the long run. Um, and, and so that's what we're, we do at US Deck, right? We're, we're here to really help um, the market understand who we are. Uh, and, and really what we're doing right now is building awareness and, and really improving that perception um, uh, of, among um, customers, international customers uh, about U.S. cheese. Um, our industry is super strong uh, on the, the commodity side. Uh, you know, they, that's what really what we're known for, I guess, at the, at the, the trade level. Uh, you know, our, on the, our cheese really goes into uh, the industrial sector, the food service sector, um, and we're doing great at that. But really, I guess the problem, I would say, <laughs> that comes out of this is that we're so good at this that uh, the rest of the of the market, like I mentioned, really they're not aware that of what they're eating. Uh, cheese that we export, you know, uh, goes into its mostly cheddar, uh, mozzarella, and cream cheese, and it it pretty much disappears in something else. So it goes into uh, on the pizza, it goes uh, on the burger, it goes into in a cheesecake, or it goes into making processed cheese in the market. So again, you know, people eat our cheese all day long, almost, but they just don't know it. Um, so you know, this is really what we are trying to do is really change the, make people understand that, that we're a lot more than this. And we've got a lot to offer compared to, you know, when people think about cheese, obviously they think about France and Italy and others. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, we've been running an omnibus survey in all the, the key markets that we operate in. And um, when we ask people, uh, you know, who do you think about when you when you think about cheese making? Uh, we the U.S. Co constantly comes in a sixth uh, place out of the top eight countries uh, that are seen as making cheese. So obviously we come far behind countries like France, uh, uh, Italy, the Netherlands. Uh, we also come behind uh, New Zealand, which you know, frankly, when you really think of it and you know what they make, they you know they they make a lot of bulk cheese and it's not a ton of fancy stuff like the Europe, like Europe, but yet people know them more than they know us. Uh, and, and even the interesting fact out of that survey 
is if you actually ask people, uh, like let's say you take consumers um, in Mexico, if you ask them, you know, who what country makes cheese, they will actually say Mexico makes cheese before they say the U.S. makes cheese. So. You know, it's really an aberration when you think about the fact that we're the largest cheese producer in the world and we're the largest cheese exporter in the world. So, you know, this is really what we're trying to do with the program is tell those stories, is, is, is take, and, and you, you mentioned it at the beginning, Corey, it's like, we make some pretty damn good cheese. You know, we, we, we um, won the World Cheese Award uh, in 2019, you know, world champion. And, you know, we, let me tell you that, forgive my French, she pissed off a lot of people in France. <laughs> You know, to hear that the U.S. Uh, was making great cheese and won the and won the um, the contest. So, you know, it's really that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to like really put that side of our um, uh, industry uh, that is a well kept secret uh, out there. And uh, and so we work on putting cheese in the mind, cheese cheese in the mouth of people. And as you mentioned, uh, the the poll question before my before me was about the certification program. So this is what we've done. We've created a certification program, the USA Cheese Specialist. Um, and we we help to educate. I would say more the masses. You know, it's not like a you know for cheese nerds. It's for for you know everyday people to really understand cheese. And so we educate um, uh, the young chef, the, the chefs of tomorrow, through um, through partnerships uh, with culinary schools. Uh, we also uh, educate culinary professionals. So that those are the chefs of today, but also you know the buyers that work with them. Um, since the, you know, the chefs are really the trendsetters, right? And then the decision makers. We work with retail professionals and we also work with the supply chain. So even though, you know, importers, distributors know us, uh, we still help them really better understand like what companies like Tropical Food do so that they can better um, teach or better, better sell to, to the retailers and the food service. Um, so this is, you know, really being starting to make a difference in, in making our name out there. And, and, you know, really we see as people, as they learn, you know, then they'll think about us, especially for the young chef, you know, they're, they'll think about us when they're, they become actually a decision maker and a buyer. Uh, we also work um, really hard on the retail side. We have a very robust retail program and, and Will could talk to it because we work very closely with him uh, in, in some markets to introduce more uh, SKUs on, on the shelves. You know, we want to make sure people um, uh, get to see more of the facings of our brands. We don't have a ton of brands, you know, because it's mostly about bulk. So we're really trying to push that out there. And obviously, you know, working all the way to like educating the consumer through promotions. Same, same thing on the food service. We work with operators. We help them, you know, menu ideation and then, you know, put it in front of, of the consumers. And finally, the, the major program that we run, which is, you know, we started this right before COVID and, you know, thank God we did because uh, it really allowed us to still remain having FaceTime when we couldn't really be face-to-face, -face, uh, digital FaceTime when we couldn't really be face-to-face. Um, and it's uh, a communication program. We've been uh, launching a social media program in all the markets that we operate in, and uh, and you know, and we're also creating all the digital assets that really help us, you know, remain in the face of people. Uh, so in a, in a nutshell, that's what we do uh, at USDEC to uh, to really uh, try to, you know, it's the next step of the journey, if you will. You know, we've done great on the commodity side, but now it's time for us to really claim our rightful place, um, you know, in the mind of people around the world. And, uh, and so uh, this is what we do. And I guess if there's two things that I'd like people to like take out of this uh, is, you know, if there is anybody listening here and, and, you know, they've got uh, export aspiration and they want to, they want to go out there, you know, we, uh, we're here to help. So, you know, give us a call uh, and, you know, we'd love to like walk you through how to do this and, and take you along. So we can also, you can be part of the story that we're telling. And, uh, and finally, the one thing I would like to say also is, um, you know, a big thank you to the uh, to the the farmers, um, you know, and and also the the, the processors. You are really great supporters of, of what we're doing. And as you heard, there's a lot more work to be done out there. And you know, without the support, uh, we couldn't do this and 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 really make a difference out there. So you know, I just want to say thank you. Um, so and with that, I turn it over, back over to you. Thank you, Angelique. And I I was just at Green Lake County talking to a small uh, county farm bureau group last night, and one of the things when I was talking about dairy exports, and uh, and I impress upon our dairy farmers and a couple of the processors that were there, is diversity of culture and diversity of backgrounds is so important, especially in an organization like the U.S. Dairy Export Council. It's that diversity of background and culture that's now being led by Krista Hardin. Uh, the CEO that really brings this entire process to life throughout the world. And uh, people like Angelique are part of that. 
And we're going to go to the next poll question here before we hear from William Linsky. And Angelique kind of touched on this in a couple of her thank yous. Who are members of the U.S. Dairy Export Council? And you can check more than one of the following if you want to. And as you're answering that question, I want to remind everybody, go ahead and ask your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. We have a number of questions that have come in already. And uh, we will target those to the person who can best answer them. So uh, we'll give everybody just a little bit of time to answer this poll question because I think it's really important to understand the breadth and scope of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. I'll give everybody one hint here with about five seconds left to answer. If I put that kind of detail in the poll question, you probably want to start clicking more than one box. But uh, we'll wrap this poll question up. And indeed, this one can be lit up like the last question. It could be all of them. U.S. Dairy ex or excuse me, U.S. Dairy farmers through the checkoff. There are 57 dairy processors who pay to be members of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. There's 15 trading companies who be, sign up to be members of the U.S. Dairy Export Council and 39 allied companies. And this is all pre-competitive work to help uh, move the U.S. dairy industry forward. And one of those, um, so all those correct answers are correct, but except for none of the above. And Tropical Foods, who represents Belgioso Cheese, is one of those members. We welcome William Linsky, Executive Vice President for Tropical Foods to Dairy Livestream. William has nearly nine years of experience with the organization, having previously served two different roles as Director of Sales and Vice President of Sales. Tropical Foods has clientele in over 55 countries, and its business was 100% focused on exports with specialization in refrigerated and frozen products. We're talking food. The company's core philosophy aims to improve lifestyles through food that begins with honest, direct, and passionate approach with their trading relationships. More simply said, I'd say this, Tropical Foods believes every customer and supplier is a lifelong partner. William, I look forward to hearing your perspective on value-added cheese exports and creating more value for the entire U.S. dairy sector. William, welcome to Dairy Livestream. Thank you, Corey, and, uh, and very well said. Um, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. I, I know we're in the in-between right now with our time zones, um, so I appreciate being here, appreciate being part of the panel. Um, as Corey mentioned, uh, we specialize in value-add branded export of highly perishable dairy products around the globe. Um, you know, I, I think the, the popular topic right now to talk about these days is COVID and the impact that it's having on the industry. Uh, we heard Stephen mention a lot on that, and I'll have some, some comments on it uh, as well. Um, but I think what's important, what I think it's important for everyone to recognize that even prior to COVID, even without COVID, um, dairy export has always been difficult. It will always be difficult, and it will only get more difficult as we move forward. Um, I said something a few years ago that stuck around our, our, our office, and we say it a lot. I say, if you want easy in export, stick to jelly beans. So all COVID has done is taken the difficult and turned it into tremendously difficult. I tell my team, I said, we just gone from basically a DEF CON 4 to a DEF CON 2 um, with what we do. And as Steven mentioned, I mean, when you look at the global logistics crisis with the port congestions, the delays, the lack of equipment, I mean, we've had two full container loads probably just in the last 30 days that were completely missed because at the last minute there just wasn't equipment. Um, so then you have the labor shortages, um, you have the, you know, the supply chain disruptions, and apparently there is no resin left on planet Earth. There, there's no resin anywhere, so now making anything in plastic tubs or bottles, um, that's a big thing. So hopefully someone will find some resin at some point. Um, but what I really wanted to share and some of the shifts in the global market that I'll talk about, the first one, what I want to share is that success in the industry that we see is just no longer about the cheese. 
and what I mean at that is, you know, you could always be successful or see success when you created a quality product and you were able to offer it at a fair value. Um, and you can still have success when you do that, especially in markets like the Caribbean. But really, when you look at the global arena as a whole, you now need to be able to add on to the quality and the value. You now need to be able to meet very strict uh, compliance requirements, and you need to be able to meet um, you know, very specific customer needs. And I say, if, if you could have the best cheddar in the world, and you can even be able to offer it at a fair value, and you will see success with that, but you will be limited. Um, if you want to get into the global market, it doesn't matter if you have a quality product at a, you know, at a fair value. If you can't meet the compliance needs, if you can't meet the customer needs, that cheddar has now just become a very tasty paperweight. So the good thing about that is you can save time and go into lunch as you sit at your desk. You can now take a bite of your paperweight and, and put it back. So what I like to say is to have success in today's market, you need to look at the, what we call the trifecta. You need, that, you need that quality and that value, but then you need to meet the compliance um, requirements in many countries around the globe so you're not so limited, and you need to meet very specific customer needs. And that might be putting translated labels on a product. It might be doing repacks. It might be meeting a specific shelf life requirement that is not regulatory, but it's an internal policy. So that's kind of one you know, touch on having success in the industry I wanted to touch on. And then I think kind of another shift that we're seeing is in, in kind of sales trends. Um, Pre-COVID, it was always about what's the next new thing? What's the um, in, up and coming? What's, what's exciting? You know, and snack cheese really started to come out and trend over the last, you know, two or three years. And then it's, you know, it's the, uh, the dairy and the protein combo packs. And, but really today what we're seeing, there's kind of been breaks on being able to get even new brands new items, new innovations out there. Because of COVID, everyone's kind of had to step back and really just look at focusing on their core. Um, you know, the customers we deal with, 90% of them, if not more, are still on work from home schedules. They have limited resources, so they're more risk averse. You have um, ports that have limited uh, labor. You have health ministries that are working on restricted hours and with limited resources. So what used to take in a lot of these markets, what used to take three days to come to clear a container can now take up to three weeks or longer. And when you're dealing with highly perishable dairy products, that has enormous, enormous impacts. So although we have less opportunity for expanding into new lines at this time, or even when you get the opportunity, what used to take maybe three weeks now takes three months to be able to get that done. But on a positive note, so it's not all gloom and doom, we try to work with our customers that the customers that understand how to pivot and where to focus, and they can say, hey, if we need to focus on this core and we're doing well with that, then let's step on the gas together. So many customers sometimes say, well, I still need 20 different brands of this item. And I say, well, do you carry 20 different brands of ketchup? And I say, so look, those that have been able to focus on the core and step on the gas, we're doing extremely well. They're, they're keeping the supply chain intact. They're keeping those products on the shelf so that it's there when the customers go in um, to buy it. And I think lastly, another kind of shift that we're seeing uh, relates to marketing and promotions. Um, simply put, when the supply chain is very constrained and unpredictable, it has a very big impact on marketing activities and promotions you can do. It's hard if we're scheduling a promotion 30, 45, 60 days out. And when the product now arrives to get delivered overseas for that, for that event, but you only got half of your product because of the supply chain disruptions and you can't supply what's being promoted. Well, that becomes a pretty difficult thing to do. You're promoting something you don't even have on the shelf. And, you know, um, I tip my hat to uh, Angelique and the U.S. DEC team. Through all this, we still been in, you guys been very active with keeping in-store promotions and activities going. And we're doing our, you know, everyone's doing our best there. Um, we're having to pivot. We're pivoting a lot on our end. I mean, we just tried giving away thousands of dollars to 
a main customer in a main market the other day for some activities in store. And they literally said, I'm sorry, we can't take your $12,000 because we can't execute right now. So one thing we've been doing, we've been shifting away from more of the in-store uh, activities and going more towards uh, brand building. So uh, we're, we're doing more in billboard programs uh, longer term. We're doing more in, we're participating in chef events. Um, we're participating in community support and outreach programs and food programs to just more build brand awareness. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, and, and, and I'll end with this. So, you know, to any of the, the, the dairy suppliers, the manufacturers out there, my advice when I talk about what I see in the global market and the shifts we're seeing, and, and I've said this for years, I just say, you know, try to have a different set of rules, a different set of eyes when it comes to export compared to domestic. When everyone looks at this is how we do it domestically, this is how we've done it for a hundred years, and this is how we're just going to apply the same to export. You really pigeonhole yourselves um, and you really limit um, what you can do. So I just say this, I say where you can be flexible, try to be flexible. Now that might be pricing. When you understand that product goes from a plant to a port, gets on a big boat, sails across a big ocean, gets to another port, goes to a DC, needs to go to the stores, there's a lot of cost in that. There's a lot of hands touching it. So when you can really look at, you know, export pricing, that helps. It might be shelf life flexibility, understanding there are certain policies out there where your current policy on shelf life really doesn't. It's going to restrict you or keep you out of markets. And lastly, I say, because I see this all the time, packaging refreshes by suppliers here in the U.S., they're now it's almost like a monthly event. Everyone refreshes packages and I get it. It's part of the business and, and usually the work is beautiful. All I say is, and you're not gonna design your packaging around export, I get it, you're gonna design it domestically, but all I say is keep export in consideration. Just give it some bit of thought because I see cases where, oh, hi, by the way, Tropical Foods, we just did a packaging refresh on 150 different SKUs and we added a little heart in here. And we say it looks beautiful, but did you know that little heart right there having on your package just kicked us out of three markets and it just cost us tens of thousands of dollars in registrations and it's going to probably take us another year to get back in. So huge impacts that a lot of people really don't understand. So I just say give export consideration in, in, in what you do and it will be better for all of us. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Back to you, Corey. Thank you, William. As a reminder, go ahead and type in your questions in the go to control uh, panel here and we'll go ahead and answer them. And our next poll question is this, since 2003, what share of all new milk production has gone to exports? None, one quarter, half, three quarters are all. This one only has one answer, so go ahead and answer it. And uh, we'll have Mark Stevenson join us and talk through a little bit of, of that here. So. We will give everybody about five more seconds to uh, answer that poll question. And the correct answer is half. That's correct. Roughly 27.5 billion pounds of new milk has been transformed into dairy products and sold to customers throughout the world. Again, in 2003, U.S. dairy farmers produced 170 billion pounds of milk. Last year, 223 billion. Exports matter that much. Mark, we've had quite a journey with U.S. dairy exports in the past two decades. Let's walk through that journey and then round back into our discussion on growth potential for the cheese category. Well, thanks, Corey. And, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. Two decades ago, it was common for us to export three to four percent of our milk production. We did that for years, many years. And then all of a sudden it began to take off to where we're now 15, 16, 18 percent of our milk supply that's being exported. All good things. Most of that growth was on the basis of milk powders um, over that time period. We kind of have been using those products to clear our markets. More than half those products are being exported from this country that we produce. And it's important, I think, to know and understand your customer. Uh, William just talked about that a little bit, but at that point in time, when we're exporting powders, much of what this was being exported for and the customers to whom it was uh, going were people who were coming up out of poverty and kind of into middle class. 
And at that point in time, it was not so much about the adequacy of calories that they were consuming, but we want to improve the quality of our diet. Let's get more animal proteins in. And it turned out, of course, that um, milk powders were a very good source of that and were reasonably economical for, for people. It also meant that since we're such a major supplier in world markets of milk powders, that uh, we have to be price competitive always. And in fact, you know, we're, we're typically price leaders of those products. So um, that's one thing. But when we start to talk about cheese, now we're talking about a different customer. And this, these are people who have been in this middle class for a period of time and are now maybe working up toward upper middle class or maybe beyond that. And this is not about nutrition so much, even though we know it's a nutritious product. This is more about taste and experience and the kind of things that, that cheese carries with it as a variety of attributes. Um, I would say that we have to be price competitive regardless of the product. Um, maybe some of our products to high-end customers that have real different taste experiences and qualities can handle a bigger, heavier price. But, you know, for the most part, we still have to be in the ballpark. And we aren't always there with cheese, or we haven't been during this big growth period. But now we are. And some of that, I think, comes down to the fact that we've added this additional cheese capacity in this country. And we're going to be thinking about clearing our markets with more cheese exports. I think this also means that cheese is always going to have to be a price competitive product for us. We still have to think about the customers and what they want, but um, you know, a good example, I know a company that was trying to crack um, uh, China for mozzarella exports, and they were having a difficult time doing that. And finally, after they went and reviewed the product and the process, they realized that China had been importing mozz from Oceania grass-based uh, milk production, and mozzarella was a slightly yellowish color to them. And ours is pure white, which our domestic customers liked and wanted. That's an attribute was good for them. But uh, that was not a good quality for this customer who was expecting mozzarella to be slightly yellowish. And so easy fix, but you had to actually know that and learn that. When we did that, you could start selling. So cheese is a different cus customer, and we need to know and understand our customers, as William said. Um, and with that, Corey, I think we ought to take the rest of the time to answer some questions. Thank you, Mark. And so we are going to move to the question portion here. We have a number of thoughtful questions from our readers. If you still have a question, go and uh, ask it at the GoToWebinar control panel. I also want to give a quick shout out. Uh, if you want to learn more about U.S. dairy exports, I encourage you to download a paper called Top 10 Questions Dairy Farmers Ask US, U.S. Dairy Export Council About Exports. The paper can be found at usdec.org, usdec.org. No matter what your role is, if you're a dairy farmer or work in dairy processing, it's a great read. And again, that paper is Top 10 Questions Dairy Farmers Ask US, dairy, US DEC About Exports, and it can be found at usdeck.org. We're going to go straight to the first question that came in here, and I'm going to um, probably ask that Angelique and Stephen ask, answer this the best they can. And I'm going to give a partial answer here. Uh, the question is, who are the major U.S. exporters, and specifically in the cheese category? Now, I want to tell our audience that U.S. Dairy Export Council is a pre-competitive group. Uh, we, we, we can't really share a, a ranking of brand A, B, and C are, are the top exporters. But I can tell you this. I moderated a panel at the Idaho Milk Processors Association last month. We had Dairy America there, Patty uh, Smith, who's the CEO. And we, I will share with you since uh, you know I moderated that panel that when it comes to milk powders, Dairy America is the world's largest uh, powder in exporter, and they represent California dairies, Arizona United Dairymen, Oetka, which is a dairy co-op in New York, and Agermark. So I, as you learn this area more, you'll learn some of these things, but we're never we're not going to give out a list. I. I, I share that there, and I, I don't know if Angelique or Stephen want to add anything to that answer. Stephen, do you want to say something, or do you want me to go? Let you take this one, Angelique. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Well, and I guess, you know, I'll talk on the, on the cheese side. I mean, we, we've got a, a lot of large um, uh, uh, companies, you know, in the industry. Uh, and most of them, because we do a lot of, uh, of bulk, you know, are, um, uh, are fairly good exporters. You know, they've, over the years, they've really grown their business. You know, they're across um, uh, you know, the states of like in California or, you know, Idaho or, or Wisconsin. These are the, are the big guys. And, you know, I guess without giving any, uh, any, any secrets, you know, if you take companies like, um, like Hilmar or Glambia or Leprino, you know, these are big, they're, they're really uh, very good um, and uh, exporters. Uh, you know, and then on the, on the more um, uh, value add side, you know, you've got companies like Schreiber that's been in the market for a long time and, you know, do really well. Um, exporting uh, branded pro uh, product. Um, um, and you know all these type of companies are uh, all the ones that are doing well. But I have to say, in my twenty years, when we used to be, um, there was you know you could count people in the, on your hand of who uh, were exporting. Uh, the the industry has really come uh, uh, along uh, over the past twenty one years, so it's really exciting to see. Well, good. We will go to the uh, next question here, and I, I think there are people that are experienced in this category, and there's audience members who are just learning about this for the first time. I'm going to read the next question here, and perhaps Stephen or Mark want to take this uh, question. Uh, where is data on exports? This particular person says all the data I can find places Germany at number one on cheese exports and U.S. at 5%. I'm going to tell you this. I've been afforded the opportunity to go on some trade missions with the U.S. Dairy Export Council. Our partners at USDA that focus on dairy data, we have and I'll say probably the most robust dairy export data and beyond dairy and livestock and all that. You, the Foreign Agricultural Service keeps great data. We know data because it's got to be tracked when product leaves our ports. But real specifically for people that may be joining us for the first time, Mark, maybe you want to tackle this one first, or, and then Stephen, where can we find this data and, and good data? I mean, there's stuff, you can find anything on the internet to say anything, but we, we need truth here. <laughs> well, probably the most accessible and uh, the best data that you can get your hands on without paying for it <laughs> is uh, going to be from the Foreign Ag Service. Um, and if you go to the websites uh, at uh, USDA, you can do a search to look at um, from countries and to countries for specific products. So you can begin to narrow that down quite a bit. So if you really wanted to know who the big exporters were of product, um, of a, a specific product, that's probably gonna be the easiest and best way to do it. US DEC actually has um, good data on their website too. Um, so you can go into there, drill down a little bit and you can find at least with regard to um, the US, not necessarily trade between non-US countries, but you can find good data there available. Stephen, anything to add on that one? Yeah, yeah, just echo that. Yeah, FAS uh, yeah, has some really great data there and uh, really just for size in the market, that's a great place to go. Um, but yeah, again, shout out. Thank you, Mark, for the shout out. US DEC has some great data on our website um, that you can uh, look at as well. Uh, but yeah, it, those are the great, free locations as well, numerous other locations you can pay for as well, but those are some great, uh, great resources. William, uh, I think you gave some great advice out and a question came in, how do you work with customers to, to meet specific needs when they ask for a product like US cheese or somebody, uh, another product that you might carry in your portfolio? And I know you carry a lot of dairy products, but uh, I, I think that interaction to meet the culture and customer is so important and you sound passionate about it. Can you expand on that? Absolutely. Um, and you're right, our portfolio actually is, is, is pretty significant. Uh, on paper, we actually represent upwards of 100 different brands and we have 30, I think 3,300 active SKU in our total portfolio. Um, and I think the first thing regarding the question that we try to distinguish is is the request that's coming from the customer is it a customer need or is it a regulatory need and, and they're two different things and sometimes those wires get crossed a lot 
And obviously we want to do as much as we can, but we don't want to do things that just don't make it you know, economically feasible. So when a request comes through uh, re re from the customer that might be regarding specific customer packaging, we'll identify, is it an internal uh, policy from the customer that they prefer to have it this way, or is it actually regulatory? And typically if it's regulatory, we're up on it, we're already doing it, we have the processes and systems in place. Um, we relabel upwards of a quarter million uh, products every single week going through our facility here in Miami. So we're unpacking, putting translated stickers on it, we're repacking, we're doing uh, custom jet coating on packaging. And these are some of the things that a lot of the suppliers don't understand. You know, it's coded this way. Well, if it's coded that way, it can't go into that country. So we do a lot of that here. And if it is not regulatory, but it's a preference or a need, an internal policy of the customer, well, we just study it and we just look at the feasibility of doing it, the resources it would take to do it, the cost to doing it. Can we do this without each having an added cost? Can we look at doing it with having an added cost? And we work through the process like that. But I tell you, for the most part, unless uh, uh, a, a request is just completely completely in, in, in left field, um, we have a very high success rate with working with customers to deliver product that they need internally, that meets internal requirements, and obviously regulatory requirements. But we have a full team, process, system, workflow that takes us through that. Thank you, William. We're going to probably go to speed round here to get all our questions answered here. And I think, Mark Stevenson, you are most likely to answer this next question here because you've studied this in great detail. Question is this, do you think that the current milk pricing system in the U.S. prevents us from growing exports or being competitive in certain long-term export product categories? I'm not sure it's always enhanced it, uh, our ability for export, but I'm not sure it's been a terribly big drag on it. Um, I do think that some pieces are coming together, a good example of which is you know, with the additional capacity that's come online for some of the cheese manufacturing in the last year or so, and what I think are going to be more exports of cheese, I think that this drives our class three and class four prices together so we don't have as much of the negative PPD issues and problems. So that's maybe a little bit backwards from what the question was being asked about, but these two things are linked. Um, I, I'm not sure that they've been a big hamper, but they haven't really helped either. We haven't been hungry to go out and find those export markets um, as a result of you know being relatively protected in our domestic markets. Angelique, the next question is for you. How have global dairy customer, excuse me, global dairy customers and consumers changed in recent years? You have you know two decades of experience with U.S. Dairy. Have you seen some? Uh, shifts in movement? Um, well, you can see where uh, in the, and I guess probably where do you see the change most is maybe in Asia where, you know, cheese um, is not part of their diet. So, you know, it's the, they, they start with uh, eating processed cheese. That's kind of like their first for you know, I guess it's drinking milk or yogurt or whatever to get started. And then they, they go into processed cheese and you can see where, um, uh, now they're there's they're actually thinking of natural cheese and um, really kind of upping their game um, uh, and I guess it goes to what Mark was saying it's like you know at first they're kind of looking for a certain you know uh, type of, of dairy and you know for nutrition but then there's more like the indulgence and stuff like that so we can see this in the market and across the market it's more like looking at cheese um, for indulgence you know like it's like uh, treating themselves and stuff like that so um, yeah. Uh, it's really uh, it's nice to see it and so it's good for for the future of of exporting our pro product that are there Stephen you watch the markets as much as anyone on here and uh, as much as mark and I even uh, could you speak about the prospects for more exports to Canada there are people on the webcast that have asked a couple of them that have asked that one there and I know that's a very fluid situation but what can you share on that yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know, Canada does a very good job at protecting their industry, their domestic industry, um, and they they don't want to let a lot of products come into the country, and they're uh, they've set up a way to to not let that be. Um, yeah, you know, I think as you know, a lot of our trade policy team, a lot of work that 
uh, Jaime Castaneda and Sean Morris do uh, with trade policy with National Milk, um, advocating for our exports into these countries and making sure that any negotiations that we enter into or agree to are upheld on both ends. I think that's a big piece here. Um, so making sure that you know we're we're continuing to advocate for exports in those countries, um, and then that those deals are held up on the back end as well. So I'm I'm hopeful that we can continue to get more access into Canada, um, but uh, you know that's a uh, that's a long road ahead, and uh, just like you said, Corey, it's a, it's a pretty fluid situation. So we'll we'll keep trying our best. Thank you. Uh, Mark, the next question is coming your way, and uh, I'll read the question, and I'm going to remind the uh, audience of a statistic that we had during the webcast. This is, comes from a dairy farmer. We've always been told that our milk price at the farm will be strong when our exports are strong. Why are we having low milk prices? I'm going to start with one premise here. As we've grown dairy exports from 2003 to 2020, we've our all the U.S. dairy farmers have grown their milk production from 170 billion pounds to 223. That is a lot of milk. But again, Mark, let's come back to that thoughtful question from the audience member. How to the interaction between exports and our milk prices? Well, <clears throat> I would say just at the uh, outset, you have to look at this as just uh, we found another customer. You know. Before, when we were largely a domestic market, if we developed new products, we'll just go back a little ways, uh, 10 years, and think about uh, Greek yogurt. Oh my gosh, we were all excited about Greek yogurt. This was something new to the American customer, and you know, we began to look at this as a bump in new dairy product, more milk needed for that. It was great. Helped to elevate the milk price. But pretty soon, you can supply more than enough milk for that Greek yogurt demand, and now you've got a downward pressure on prices. Same thing is true for exports. Um, exports help us grow, so it's not always a matter about bringing the price up. It can, in the short term, do that if we get a little bit tight, but think about it more in terms of bringing the revenues up because the volume of milk, as you point out, is much bigger, and if the price is staying close to the same or maybe a little higher sometimes, a little lower other times, we've certainly got a lot more volume your revenue at the farm is much bigger because of export sales um, than it would otherwise have been. Price is a little more indifferent. And William, the final question is going to be yours uh, as we wrap up speed round here. And you carry a number of products <clears throat> outside of cheese. What does the future look like for dairy exports when you look at your customers? Um, yeah, so um big and dairy so we have the cheese we have the yogurt we have the milk those are our primary um dairy and uh cheese is top for us outside of cheese um the yogurt and the milk um we're seeing strong growth with that as well um but we have larger challenges when it comes to those two categories and primarily because we're dealing with even more highly perishable products given shelf life. So yogurts, as you know, uh, they're, they're, they're typically, uh, you know, they're, they're 40 day products. Greek gets a little bit more um, and milks in the ESLs were in the, you know, in the, in, in the 60 day range and, and even lower guarantees. So although we're, we're seeing growth in that, especially in the more regionalized markets in our backyard of the Caribbean, and Latin America, um, it, it is a challenge to get those to other parts of the globe, simply because of the challenges with uh, um, uh, with the shelf life. With that said, I you know we we do have air programs. We do have yogurt going all the way into Asia. We have yogurt going into Hong Kong um, by air, but it's definitely it just makes that challenge that we talked about even e even more challenging. So we try to stick more regionally in our backyard with it um, but if we can make improvements on shelf life um, we can always expand to the further reach markets so many of our gifted dairy export companies like you william are more of a, a logistics company than you are a product specialist because you got to figure out how to get a from the, here to somewhere else and get it there so that it can be consumed by consumers and an enjoyable experience 
So our next dairy live stream will air on uh, Wednesday, October 20th, 2021, uh, 11 o'clock Central Daylight Time, and it'll be archived just like this episode on the Hordes Dairyman YouTube and podcast channels the very next day. I look forward to seeing you then. On behalf of Stephen Kane, Angelique Collister, William Linsky, Mark Stevenson, and our producer Jim Baltz, and my coworker here, Caitlin Allen, who worked through the questions, I thank you for joining us today and wish you all a good day. Have a Take care, everyone.